Hey folks, welcome back. Today we're talking about complexity science, which is my personal favorite learning theory. And this is a newer learning theory, so it will quite likely be very different from what many of you have experienced yourself as learners. So like our previous modules, we're going to start off by talking about what's going on here epistemologically before we delve into what complexity science is. And then we're going to end things off by talking about some ways we can apply complexity science to our own teaching practice. So for the last time in this course, uh, let's revisit our epistemology tree. So this week we're going to be continuing on the um, physical branch. For the past couple of modules, we've been sitting on the intersubjectivity branch specifically while discussing constructivisms, communities of practice, and critical pedagogy. Um, and in this um, module, we're going to be making more of an epistemological jump over to interobjectivity. So while here you will see a different perspective on teaching and learning and knowing, we are still talking about coherence theories of learning. So complexity science has that in common with our past two modules. And the interobjectivity branch is focused on all um, phenomena and the functions of relationships between things. And this is a jump from our um, intersubjectivity branch, which focused on how people construe reality, because now we're also considering the more than human world in relation to learning and teaching. And sometimes this can be initially um, quite a bit to take in because it is a pretty big departure um, from more mainstream or traditional ideas of learning. Um, but I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on even what the past year has looked like in teaching and learning. Uh, so many of you have reflected on in your portfolios and in your assignments about how much the pandemic has really disrupted teaching and education. Many of us have been teaching and learning online for the past year or so, and this use of technology has also impacted learning. Uh, so for example, I've had students who have lost their internet connection, say, due to weather up north, and that has a significant impact on their ability to learn. Now, communities of practice in our last module really challenged this idea that learning is just something that occurs in our minds. And now I challenge you to consider whether learning is something that only occurs between people. And more broadly, is it really just about how we construct our realities? So here within interobjectivity, we are looking at the world as consisting as dynamic relationships, um, not things or eternal ideals. So here, um, things, processes, and living systems all emerge through effective interaction, and they emerge at multiple levels. So much like the nested systems diagram we discussed previously in the semester. Um, so these can range from cellular to people to societies to ecosystems, which is very much the way that I have set up EDU 5253. And there are two branches on the interobjectivity branch, um, complexity science and ecology. And both of these branches are concerned with humans, culture, and the more than human biological and ecological worlds, and how they're all interconnected. And in both knowing is seen as continually emerging from between these um, constantly changing relationships. And we're going to be talking about complexity science for this course, um, but I do have other videos that also talk a bit more about ecological discourses of learning, which I will link down below. So with that, let's get into complexity science. And complexity science emerged in the 1980s, and while its underlying assumptions and concepts are relatively new to educational, social, and health fields, uh, they aren't new within the sciences. And a lot of the key concepts within complexity science date back to the 1920s, drawing on physics, chemistry, biology, and environmental sciences. And while complexity science has some commonalities with the previous learning theories we've discussed, because it is a coherence theory of learning, it differs because it recognizes not only the social, but also the biological role in knowing, learning, and teaching. And it is often described as a transdisciplinary or a holistic approach to describing the behavior of complex systems as a whole and their interacting component parts that give rise to that system. And complexity science views the world as being um, consisting of ever-changing and interconnected complex adaptive systems, ranging from cellular to ecological. One of the ways you can think of this is through the nested systems diagram. And I think one of the best ways to understand what a CAS is, is to start with what they are not. So there are three types of systems, simple systems, complicated systems, and complex systems. Simple systems have very few component parts and they can be analyzed using Newtonian science or reductionism. So we can reduce these systems to their component parts to better understand them. For example, you can understand how a pocket watch works or how a car works by taking them apart and looking at the component parts. And their behavior is linear, so we can make predictions about the behavior of that system. 
And complicated systems are very similar to simple systems. The big difference being that a complicated system has far more component parts, which makes it trickier and more complicated as the name implies. Thus, accuracy with a complicated system can be more of a challenge. And as you may be able to imagine, this sort of reductionist approach, while extremely popular, doesn't work for everything. So for those of you who are teachers, you, we can't always predict how our learners are going to behave or react to something. And we can say the same in healthcare. For example, we don't always know how the body is going to react to a certain medication or a certain um, treatment regimen. And this is because our classrooms and our bodies aren't simple or complicated systems. They are complex systems or complex adaptive systems, as you may hear them called. And complex systems are open, adaptive, self-organizing systems. And these systems emerge from the interaction of their component parts. So for example, our classrooms emerge from the learners and teacher interacting with one another. And some examples of complex systems or complex adaptive systems include organ systems, your immune system, you yourself as a person, uh, communities that were members of, societies that were members of, of, and even ecosystems. So the complexity of our bodies, our classrooms, and our societies, for example, um, can be understood by reducing them to their component parts because their behavior is emerging from the component parts interacting with one another. So I, for example, can't be understood by reducing me to my component parts because I am much more than just a sack of organs. And likewise in classrooms, we can't understand our classes as a collective by just looking at each individual in isolation because the classroom collective and its behavior emerges from the learners interacting with one another. And as I'm sure many of you have experienced in your teaching, each classroom has its own evolving identity and two classrooms can be very different despite following the same curriculum and having the same teacher. And this is because your classrooms are complex adaptive systems. Um, I've also read quite a few articles on this in healthcare. Uh, for example, I remember reading one in primary care that talked about how you can implement the same intervention or policy, like a best practice guideline, for example, and it may work really, really well in one setting, but not so well in another setting. Uh, even if these two, say, clinics look very, very similar on paper. And this is because the individual workers in that setting and the patients make for very unique systems that will react differently to the intervention. And we can also understand musical pieces like this because we can't understand a song just by looking at, say, the individual notes in isolation. The rhythm, the melody, the harmony are all going to emerge as the different notes and other aspects of music theory, of course, like tempo and dynamics, interact with one another, giving rise to the song. So now let's end things off with some implications for teaching. So specifically here, we are going to focus on the five ideas or conditions that we can think about for our classrooms from a complexity science perspective and to nurture mutually supportive individual and group learning. First two conditions within complexity science that we can consider as educators are nurturing diversity and redundancy in our classes. And I'll start off by talking a bit about redundancy. And this condition ensures that parts of a complex system have common ground so they can interact with one another. So let's say in a class you want to do some group work, whether it be projects or say discussion groups, um, you want to ensure that there is sufficient redundancy or commonality within the group something that group members can bond over. Um, so for example, this could be similar interests, similar backgrounds. Um, in our program, in this graduate program, I also like to consider professional backgrounds, what ages um, my learners teach themselves, um, their teachables, like what subjects do they teach, their concentration in our program, etc. cetera. Um, another way you can support redundancy in groups is by assigning a common reading for your groups to discuss. However, you don't want to have too much redundancy in a group because from a complexity science standpoint, at least, um, you'll have a less intelligent learning system if there's too much redundancy. And this is where diversity comes in. And diversity is harnessing the rich background experiences and education that our learners are bringing to the classroom. And having diversity makes for more intelligent systems and supports innovation. And it's not to say that individuals and groups are any less intelligent when there's less diversity. But when you have a group with some diversity, there is going to be more richness in the discussions that they have because the possibilities of what can be known at the collective level is going to be far greater what, than what anyone could have learned individually on their own. And of course, you don't want to have too much diversity in a group because then they'll have nothing to bond over. So you want to have a balance between diversity and redundancy in your groups. And one of the ways I like to support diversity and redundancy is by having my learners fill out a survey at the beginning of the semester telling me a little bit about themselves and what their goals are for the class. 
as well as having them introduced to the class before I even set up any sorts of um, discussion groups or MLC groups. And this way I can be mindful of diversity and redundancy when I am formulating the groups that they're going to be in. So I never do my groups alphabetically and I generally really try to avoid grouping people strictly by their concentration in the program. The third condition we can consider here is enabling constraints. And like Dr. McMurtry points out on his website, Complexity Presents, we don't want our classes to be anything goes because that will be complete and utter chaos. Um, but we also don't want too much structure because then that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for innovation and creativity in our learning. So we want to provide some structure while leaving room for innovation. And we can do this by being proscriptive rather than prescriptive in our teaching. So proscriptive, um, a good example of this would be sports. So we would say these are the rules, don't do X, Y, and Z, but otherwise go for it. And this allows for a lot of creativity and innovation. Whereas a prescriptive um, approach would be dictating what our learners need to do. So telling them you must do this. We can also use enabling constraints by allowing for some flexibility in how our learners enact their learning. For example, in my classes, I allow my um, learners to use different modalities to communicate what they've learned, such as papers, videos, narrated PowerPoint presentations, poster presentations, etc. Um, I do give them criteria to follow, and they have to be addressing the course learning objectives, which provides that constraint or structure. And from an inclusive education standpoint, I find this approach also to be very beneficial. Um, in the past, I have had students struggle with some assignments due to a learning exceptionality. For example, um, I've had some students with dyslexia who have struggled with writing papers. They can do it, but it does take them longer because um, things like reading the articles, writing, proofreading their work can be a more time consuming. Um, so by using enabling constraints and being more flexible, it allows them to find better ways of showcasing and communicating what they've learned to me. Um, another way you can use enabling constraints in your teaching is by using choice boards. And I have an example up here that Dr. McMurtry shares on his website. And he mentions that choice boards are fairly popular in primary and junior teaching. And they allow for some flexibility in how students are enacting their learning. And I have also used choice boards as well um, in my own teaching with adult students um, for smaller assignments. The fourth condition we consider is neighboring interactions. So in complex systems like our classrooms, parts of the system need to be able to influence one another by bumping up against one another, by interacting, um, by influencing one another. And a way you can bring in complexity science here is to incorporate activities where your learners get to interact with one another. Um, for example, you could assign different readings that your group could be discussing. And in the past, I've had profs who assign us readings that they know would get us really fired up and get us debating topics in class. And the fifth and final condition we can consider here is decentralized control. So as a teacher, you can't control everything <laughs> as trying to do so will likely result in boredom or rebellion in your classroom. So from a complexity science standpoint, it's better to engage your student in the unfolding of the classroom activities and ideas. And you still have to ensure that the focus stays on the subject matter. Um, you need to make sure boundaries are maintained and just generally manage the classroom. But here your role as a teacher would be seen as being more of a guide. Something else I think you can consider here is approaching planning or teaching from more of a designing for teaching perspective. So planning tends to be quite narrow and very situation specific, whereas designing some, is something that can be uh, much more open. So for example, in um, designing activities, we can come up with activities and assignments that are very open and invite our learners to go beyond planned experiences for example, giving them very open-ended tasks. For example, in this class where learners are given options to use different modalities and explore different issues or theories of interest to them in relation to the course. And of course, these five conditions aren't the only way we could think about complexity science and how we can apply it to our teaching. Uh, for example, complexity science also supports child-centeredness or a more learner-centric approach to teaching and learning. It um, supports um, experiential and exploratory learning. Um, complexity science supports local and institutional decision making and interdisciplinary or interprofessional curriculum. And it also supports this notion of learning as being a process rather than focusing on the content of learning itself. And that's all for now, folks. I am going to end things off here. If you have any questions about complexity science or the application piece of it, um, please do reach out to me. I'm more than happy to field questions. And with that, I will see you all online. Bye.